welcome, welcome. Thank you for being here. This is the uh, second lecture or part two of the massacres and the horrible atrocities committed against the Assyrians by Badr Khan and Nurallah, the chief or the emir of the tribe or the um, emirate of Botan, that's uh, Badr Khan and Nurallah. And I want to just talk to you for a couple of minutes, uh, as I did before, about the sources. And uh, I think I need to correct myself because I earlier said that the voice of the Assyrians is not really present in all of these situations. Well, it is sort of um, not as good as we want it to be, but there is correspondence, for example, by Mar Oraham Shumun writing to various people, uh, particularly Westerners, uh, who he is trying to solicit to assist him and believing that they are not mere missionaries because one of the um, missionaries, Asahel Grant, whom we will mention repeatedly in this uh, class and in other classes as well, took a position of neutrality, quote unquote. And um, although he was in the thick of a very difficult situation, uh, a very violent situation, uh, stirring in the Hakkari, he refused, even when he was begged by various Assyrian mountaineers, various uh, people who felt vulnerable to the ensuing attacks of Badr Khan and Nurallah, he refused to assist in any way, refused to give counsel, refused even to um, tell the Kurds to back down, uh, even though they used him as a physician. So when writing to people like Grant, Mar Oraham Shumun, constantly sought um, not only, and Badger, by the way, uh, George Percy Badger, who was the British missionary to the Assyrians, um, the Church of England, and there was constant competition, by the way, between these missionaries. But Marshamun's writings to Badger, to Grant, and to others, uh, to various British officials, um, are really a kind of a sad, horrific look at the state of the Assyrians during this time. And uh, particularly so because his understanding was that, and, and we will make reference to this, his understanding was that these were Christian powers and the Christian West naturally would come to the aid of the Christian East. Well, nothing was further from the truth. Nothing was further from reality because the reality really reflected a, an understanding of real politique. Um, these leaders in the West viewed the Assyrians, um, Nestorians, as they sometimes referred to them in their correspondence, uh, viewed them as a, um, perhaps uh, pitied them, sometimes admired them for having um, independent power, but nevertheless really viewed them as a pawn in, a, in the larger game of trying to compete against Russia and perhaps France in the case of Britain, and uh, the faltering Ottoman Empire. So they weren't more important than a small factor in the big picture for many of these politicians, although some became, you could see in their writings, emotionally attached to the Assyrians and had a great deal of admiration for them. Nevertheless, the policies of these countries, despite the emotional expressions of support to the Assyrians, 
given to the Assyrians or about the Assyrians didn't amount to much in terms of policy. So there was no change in British policy, um, for example, to aid the Assyrians in seeking better arms, um, in seeking assistance, military assistance, or monetary assistance even. So it did not really um, mean much, this, these expressions of support, emotional expressions of support. There is one poignant passage that I want to refer to when we're discussing the massacres of Badr Khan Bey. And that is the ties to the West as viewed by uh, William Ainsworth, a British uh, visitor to the East and a missionary. And he tells us that the sudden interest in the Assyrians could be a very dangerous thing. So it's a bit of a warning to the Assyrians. And he tells us that the Assyrians um, have been called forth into new importance in the eyes of the Muslims and will undoubtedly be the first, this will undoubtedly be the first step to their overthrow unless they are assisted in such an emergency by sound advice or the friendly interference of the representatives of brotherly Christian nations and Constantinople. That didn't happen, of course, unfortunately for the Assyrians and unfortunately for anyone who has any sort of uh, compassion for a vulnerable people being targeted by not only their neighbors, their immediate neighbors, the Kurds in this case, the Kurdish Emirates, but also by the entire sort of Ottoman force that surrounded those neighbors. So from Erzurum, which is in Turkey, to Mosul, the Ottoman armies and the Ottoman officials, the Pashas, as they were known, the Walis, um, stood by and saw what we are going to discuss today as the outcome of the conflicts that uh, the Assyrians and Kurds uh, experienced. So we talked about the Ottomans hoping for a conflict, and today we are going to discuss a specific personality who was, who the patriarch believed, the patriarch Mar Oraham Shimon believed was a sympathetic person and could assist uh, because of the centralizing efforts of the Ottomans during this time and their interest in putting in place law and order, as it were. And this was the, this was the call, this was the rhetoric used by the Ottomans. And so he was hoping that um, one of these officials would come to his aid and interfere with the connivance and the planning of the Kurdish emirates against him. But little did he know that actually um, the opposite was true and that the hope was that there would be a conflict and, um, and that from this conflict would result a better situation for the Ottomans. In other words, their plans to centralize the Ottoman Empire by getting rid of both the Assyrians and the Kurds would come to fruition. And we said that Marshimun had been struggling um, with outside oppression, as well as with uh, internal struggles within his nation, within his people, within his tribes. Some were less loyal than others to him. Some believe that he had a desire to acquire much more power than he was entitled to. And so the, the jealousy that uh, was fostered against Marshamun not only came from the various Kurdish officials, but also from his own people who were hoping to have um, less control by Marshamun. His hope, as we will see, was 
for him to be able to unite the Assyrians under his command and to be able to fight off any danger coming from the Kurdish Emirates. Now, we spoke to last time, and I want to pick up a little bit about this uh, situation where the patriarch had come to Ashitha, as this is described, this, this scene is set up by Grant and then repeated by Badger, uh, Reverend Grant, the American missionary, and then repeated by George Percy Badger, the British missionary to the Assyrians from the Church of England. Um, the patriarch comes to Ashitha and he is greeted by various people and the winds of war, as it were, are blowing in the Hakadi area and Ashitha is the largest Assyrian village in the uh, entire um, Assyrian Hakadi. And he comes to Ashitha where also there are many priests, many learned people. This is a village known um, besides for its warriors uh, in the lower Tiari. Ashitha is in the lower Tiari. It is also known for many men uh, of learning in the uh, church tradition, in the Church of the East tradition. So we talked last time about how the patriarch was greeted, the description uh, he was given uh, by uh, both Grant, Reverend Grant and Badger, who had seen him. And uh, Badger also had told us that when he's seen him years after this conflict, that he had shown uh, much wear and tear, as it were, on his face, much gloom on his face. And the portrait that Badger had painted on his book, The Nestorians and Their Rituals, uh, he described the uh, unfortunate patriarch as a mere wreck of him, his former self. So let's pick up where we left off in part two of the Badr Khan and Nurallah massacres of the Hakkari Assyrians. And by the way, I want to point out that, and keep in mind this meeting in, in Ashitha by the patriarch and the leaders in Ashitha, as well as the priests and, and others. Keep that in mind because I will return to this in this lecture to talk about what Marshamun wanted from his people at this time. But let's go back to set the scene a little better in 1835. This is close to a decade prior to the situation that was to face the Assyrians. In 1835, the Ottomans appoint Muhammad Pasha to Mosul. Muhammad Pasha is part of an effort to centralize Ottoman power. So he seeks to add to his power. And this is going to be at the detriment or at the cost of what are known as the Kurdish Emirates, which are autonomous, semi-independent entities in Hakkari, Botan, Soran, and other places, Rwandus, and so on. So the Ottomans have not been able to penetrate many of these places, or if they could penetrate them, have chosen to leave them as autonomous entities, and among them in the Hakkari, are included the Assyrians. And um, we are told that in conversations with Asahel Grant, an Assyrian bishop, Mariu Hannan, states that Assyrians number about 500,000 in Hakkari and Mosul, with Marshamun having 12,000 warriors at his side ready to fight, and that most powerful Kurds could not subdue the Assyrians. And this is from the Missionary Herald, courtesy of Marshamun.com. These quotes, by the way, concerning the Assyrians, um, and I, I should tell you that the number 500,000 by more contemporary scholars is, is thought to be exaggerated. The, the closer number is often less than that, perhaps 250 or even 150. And the numbers fluctuate. As I've repeatedly said, in these lectures, the numbers of Assyrians, because no one was really doing any census. Be, th be that as it may, I just want to 
emphasize this point that various visitors to the Assyrians had always stated that the Assyrians were a difficult group to control in the Hakkadi. A difficult group to control in the Hakkadi mountains because they had been armed, they were organized in, in tribal uh, groups, and the Kurds were not able, and in fact, going back in time, uh, not only were they not able to subdue them, but had needed their assistance in fighting larger powers, such as, for example, the Iranian uh, armies during the Safavid uh, times when Assyrian warriors were used uh, under Kurdish control, under the Kurdish emirates, um, to fight off uh, the Shia power of Iran. Now, why the question may be asked, why didn't Assyrians have their own emirates? Well, part of this has to do with the system set up by the Ottoman Empire. And we will talk more about this in the future. The, the whole system of, of Islamic rule and uh, something that is really that, that was planned for not just the Hakkadi area, not just the Middle East, but also in Europe, that Islam, a Muslim um, leader was supposed to uh, be the head of an emirate or a region, and that Christians were supposed to be subservient. So it goes back to that type of ideology, which, which was really part of the structure of the Ottoman Empire. At any rate, the Assyrians are perceived by many foreigners who visit the area as very powerful in the Hakkadi, not so in the area of Turabdin, for example, and not so in the Nineveh Plain, not so in the area of Urmia and Salamis, but this is certainly the case in the Hakkadi area. And this is possibly the largest number of compact, compact Assyrian community at this time, living in and around the Hakkadi area, which is southeastern Turkey. In 1838, of course, this year is disputed, Marshamun, with the support of Nurallah, had planned on leading 3,000 armed tribesmen to join an attack with Ismail Pasha to retake Ahmadiyya from Blind or Kur Muhammad. However, the Patriarch was forced to withdraw due to Ottoman involvement. He received a letter from Muhammad Pasha of Mosul. According to Badger, Muhammad Pasha warned Marshamun not to help Ismail Pasha because he, on behalf of the Ottomans, laid claim to it, meaning to Ahmadiyya. And I need to explain this to you because you have to understand all of these people involved, although they are Kurdish, they are fighting each other. So one blind Muhammad, who is the originally the head of Rwandus, is the mir of the Rwandus area who's conquering the territory of another Kurd, and that is Ismail Pasha. Ismail Pasha's family had led Ahmadiyya, the, the fortress city, for many years, and he was deprived of this. And once a blind Muhammad or Kur Muhammad takes the city, Muhammad Pasha of Mosul views it as an opportunity to have the Kurds fight among themselves so that he can assert Ottoman power in the area. So for Muhammad Pasha, this is a good thing. And he is going to plan to take blind Muhammad, who is later killed by the Ottomans or disappears. He, he asks for forgiveness, but he somehow disappears. He is planning to take the city, he being Muhammad Pasha of Mosul, and have Ottoman, Ottoman rule there. And instead of supporting Ismail Pasha to gain what had been his territory, he in fact wants to imprison Ismail Pasha. So the goal of Muhammad Pasha, which Marshamun seems to be interfering in, is to simply take Ahmadiyya for himself and place it under the rule of Mosul and 
move everyone far away from there and take Ismail Pasha and keep him as a prisoner as long as he is able to keep him or hold him under control so that he has no power. Ultimately, the goal here for Muhammad Pasha and for the Ottomans is to simply centralize these areas to make them a part of Mosul. Now, each Pasha is interested in his own power, but remember, Istanbul, which rules all of them, is interested in its power. So there's a, a game being played here, and I don't want to get too deep into this in our lecture here, but there's a game being played here by the port, what is called the, the Sultan, or the Ottoman port, the, the sublime port, as, as it is referred to many times, and the various pashas that rule in various cities across the Ottoman Empire. And one of them is the Pasha of Mosul, another one is the Pasha of Erzurum, and so on. These pashas also are interested in gaining their powers. You could view this as a system of federalism or centralization versus uh, greater uh, autonomy for the periphery. And mixed in with this are these semi-autonomous or semi-independent entities that we call the Kurdish Emirates. And mixed in with those, specifically in the Hakkari area, are the difficult um, uh, Assyrian tribes, difficult for the Emirates to control. Um, so it's important to know what is going on here between the various entities. And of course, mixed into this are also the rivalries between Catholic and Protestant missionaries to influence the Assyrians and the Church of the East. Um, it, we are told that in 1838, Rassam, the British vice consul at Mosul, who was himself an ethnic Assyrian, comes from a Chaldean family in Mosul, further complicated the issue. Many Assyrians were misled by this and could not transcend their inherited tradition which viewed all Christians as brothers. But of course, most Westerners no longer shared this attitude. And I want to emphasize this point because it's relevant for this lecture of how the Assyrians viewed Western powers. And this is going to be repeated again, I think many times again in the future up until today, certainly in the First World War, Assyrian expectations of Britain. Um, we will come to this when we discuss the First World War. And we will also come to it in the post-war settlements after the First World War. And we will come to this view of, of Western powers in the 1930s when the Assyrians deal with the Semele massacre. And we will come to this, my apologies, and we will come to this once again, when we talk about the expectations of the Assyrians after the, um, after the war on Iraq in 2003. So this expectations of, expectation of the West, because it is quote unquote Christian, is going to come up again and again. And it is going to mislead the Assyrians into not really understanding the situation, the political situation and understanding it, understanding it in terms of sort of religious uh, and emotional support from the West. In the 1840s, we are told that the mountain Assyrians are exceedingly an exceedingly brave people, always carry their rifles when they go out and are a terror to the surrounding tribes of Kurds with uh, some of whom they are brought into frequent collision. Now, not only, and, and it's important to keep this in mind, not only are the Assyrians at war with the Kurds sometimes, they are also at war with themselves sometimes. And in prior to a few decades prior to uh, this quote being made by Asahel Grant, a missionary, the tribes of Diari and Tchuma had fought for a period reputedly of seven years, allegedly seven years, although sometimes we, we think that that's a metaphor, uh, seven year period, but 
there is no doubt that there were often hostilities between the uh, Assyrian tribes, and oftentimes some tribes allied themselves with Kurds against other Assyrians, and at other times they allied themselves together against other Kurds, at other times they allied themselves with other Kurdish tribes against other Kurdish tribes. And so really the, the center for many of these Assyrians, although it was loosely connected to the patriarch and the patriarch was theoretically the head of all the Assyrian tribes, the center really was the tribe itself in the Hakadi Mountains. In 1840, as we said, um, the view of the Assyrians towards their Western brothers was that the West was Christian and it was going to save them. It certainly would not allow them to suffer. And we have a, a report um, in the Missionary Herald uh, that that I would love to quote to you and uh, comment on. I had some interesting conversations with the two brothers of the patriarch. They were very desirous to know the comparative strength of the principal European nations and why it was that they did not unite in a crusade against the Muslims. I have heard, said the elder brother, the expected successor of the patriarch, that your country is too far distant, but the kings of England, Russia, and France are Christian kings. And why do they permit us, their Christian brethren, to be trodden underfoot and consumed by these heathen? I found it difficult to turn his mind from these political subjects, among other things which he thought highly important to be done for his people. He insisted that some of our people or of the English who were skilled in making firearms should come to live among the independent Nestorians or Assyrians, and he gave and he gravely assured me that they would find employment enough and make a profit. So the understanding of this missionary is that the Assyrian, the brother of the patriarch, is not understanding what the goal of the missionary is and certainly has no comment concerning any possible crusade that the Christian, quote unquote, Christian West is going to engage in on behalf of the Assyrians or assist them. Very important to know that prior to the trouble beginning for the Assyrians, Nurallah and the Pasha in Erzurum in southeastern Turkey, which we see in the map right here, which is to the northwest of uh, Kuchanos, which is to the south of Lake Van. He allies with the Ottoman Pasha. Remember, the Ottomans are trying to centralize their empire. It's very important for them to try to centralize their empire for various reasons. One of them is Western influence, whether it is economic or military or political influence. They are trying to counter it by centralizing uh, their power. And the Pashas have a deep interest in this, not only for the overall goal, but also empowering themselves within their areas. So a, a um, deal is made between Nurallah, who had previously controlled his, um, his emirate, that he, inf he uh, enact a type of tax system that is uh, similar to the jizya tax, haraj tax uh, for non-Muslims from all the Assyrians. Nurallah uh, also begins intriguing with various Maliks and agreeing to deliver to them the portion of the patriarch's annual uh, ecclesiastical revenue set aside for the patriarch. The port, or the sultan, in turn, seeks to gain control over the Kurds. So we see the patterns here, that the Ottomans are plotting to instill in the Kurds that they have a chance to be part of this empire, to profit from it. And then the Kurds in turn are dividing the Assyrians along lines where they would have a, an influence, not knowing what the goals of the Ottomans are. In 1841, the 
attempt is made for the first time in centuries on the life of Mar Oraham Shimon. The Ottoman government uh, divides Kurdish authority over the Hakkari between Nurallah Beg and his nephew Suleiman Beg. Now, remember that Suleiman was the son of the original emir or the prince of Hakkari, but Nurallah allegedly being more of a skilled politician and perhaps a ruthless politician, uh, took over the spot of his brother and relegated Suleiman Beg, who happened to be the friend of Marshaman or the friendlier one to Marshaman, Mar Oraham Shimon, relegated him to a secondary position. The Ottomans being very shrewd in dividing and conquering the Kurds themselves, and then later, of course, the Assyrians, plan to give Nurallah one area within the Hakkari and give his nephew another area, perhaps in the hope that the two would come to clash in the near future or would be sparked into a conflict. Malik Barhu of Tchuma and Malik Ismail of Tiari intrigue to supplant Nurallah Bey with Suleiman Bey because of the various intrigues that Nurallah is engaged in against the Assyrians. Marshaman attempts to dissuade them. They actually commit themselves to try to kill or assassinate Nurallah Bey and to replace him with a Suleiman Bey. But Marshaman refuses uh, to go along with this and he dissuades them. Nurallah Bey, having learned about these intrigues against him, attempts to kill the patriarch in Qutzanus. And uh, this attempt, by the way, is assisted by the Ottomans. And this uh, takes place in Qutzanus, where the house of um, Marshamun is burned in Qutzanus. And he escapes uh, and resides in Jilu for a number of months before coming together with Malik Ismail, and then he resides in Diz. It takes him approximately nine years or eight years to go back to his house in Qutanus. The Assyrians at this time are divided. Some side with the Emir over Marshamun and the Maliks. Others uh, side with the Maliks and Marshamun, are loyal to Marshamun. Marshamun is understanding of the centralization. He has some understanding of what the Ottomans are doing, and he seeks the assistance of Muhammad Pasha of Mosul, whose intentions are, unbeknownst to Marshamun, to divide and conquer the Hakkari and the Assyrians and the Kurds with them. First, by having Badr Khan Bey and Nurallah destroy Assyrian power in Hakkari, which is formidable and then by destroying Kurdish power or doing away with it. Now, very important, again, to know the locations of where we are talking about. These areas are just south of the Lake Van and to the west of Lake Urmia. There you see in the first arrow, Kuchanus or Kuchanus, and then Ashitha, a very important village in the lower Tiari. Upper Tiari is just to the north of Lower Tiari. So the Ottomans and the Kurds are now, now when we say the Kurds, please keep in mind that we are not talking about the entire nation. There certainly is no understanding of this at this time. There is no nationalistic movement on the part of the, the Kurds. Certainly Islam plays a role. And I would say, Islam is the leading ideology for many of these Kurds, but there is no nationalistic sentiment on the part of the Kurds to, as it were, do away with the Assyrians. But Asahel Grant reminds us, I have on this day learned from the Pasha of Mosul, whose camp I have just returned from, whose camp I have just returned, that all my fears regarding the subjugation of the mountain Assyrians have been realized. If so, they are no longer the independent Assyrians as they have hitherto been. The Pasha says that a united Turkish and Kurdish army from 
Wan, Jazeera, and Hakari has subdued the independent Assyrians and burned the house of their patriarch. That whole region, he says, has been the scene of war and commotion, but the Assyrians, he repeated with seeming exultation, are now conquered. So very important to know what the intentions of uh, Muhammad Pasha were of Mosul towards the Assyrians, because the intentions of Marshumun were different, not having knowledge of what the Pasha was doing or what he was planning. So now we go back to when the patriarch was in Ashitha and he spoke to his people at that time as the winds of war are gathering at this time as he is being surrounded by the forces of the Kurds. Shamasha Ishaq sat at a distance from his brother Marshamun, Maruraham Shamun, who opened the meeting with reference to a letter from Muhammad Pasha of Mosul. So keep in mind what, the, what Muhammad Pasha of Mosul wants, who complained that some Assyrians from Tiari had assisted Zinarbeg. By the way, the, the name is spelled differently, Zinarbeg or Zinarbeg. The Kurdish chief in Berwar, who was considered an outlaw and who was now being protected by Badr Khan within his jurisdiction. Friends and brethren, the patriarch says, I am come here on business of the government, on the business of Muhammad Pasha of Mosul. It remains with you to decide whether you will accede to my proposition at once or whether you will detain me here for 40 days longer. This prelude was answered by a low bow from all present and the exclamation proceeding from a hundred voices, upon our heads have you come. It's a, um, of course, a Syrian metaphor and an Eastern metaphor expressive of loyalty and devotion to the person who is speaking. So the patriarch here is asking the people of Ashitha, are you going to follow what I advise you, which is that we have to be loyal to the Ottoman Empire, or are you going to collude with various Kurdish outlaws? Which will you choose? Are you going to keep me here to try to convince you for 40 days, or are you going to basically agree with me that we should be loyal to the Ottoman Empire. Of course, he does not realize that the Ottoman Empire he speaks of is not loyal to him. So the people tell him, yes, we are loyal to you, your holiness, and so on and so forth. And he proceeds, your words incline me to believe that you are my obedient followers, and why should it not be so? Other villages accuse me of partiality toward you, to you. And you all know my affection for you. Cries of, we are your servants, we are your subjects. Yet I fear that there are some among you who are not faithful. Some there are even at Ashitha who do as they please, follow what leader they please, and acknowledge no other authority than their own. Tell me, whose subjects are you? Are you under the control of Nurallah Beg? of Hakari or of Muhammad Pasha of Mosul or of Badr Khan Beg of Jazeera, meaning of Botan or Zinar Beg. And cries of, we are your slaves, we are your slaves, walk over our necks, we will die for you. So what is going on here is that the people of Ashitha, those gathered around Marshamun are expressing their loyalty to Marshamun, agreeing with him, he is angry, he is chastising them because he is concerned that colluding with various Kurdish powers at a time when the Ottoman Empire is centralizing is going to be very dangerous for all of the Assyrians, including himself as well. And by the way, this comes after the burning of his residence by Nurallah and with the cooperation of the Ottomans. The patriarch urges this alliance. Some of you, I understand, consort with Zenar Bey. Now, are you so blind that you cannot foresee the consequences of such folly? Zenar Bey is a rebel, and it has been intimated to me by Muhammad Pasha that some of you are abetting him. 
It is the intention of the Pasha to send a strong force against him, and such a charge proved against you would be amply sufficient to justify his proceeding to attack you also. And are you so desirous to see the infidel soldiers among you that you are doing all in your power to invite them? In other words, Marshamun is telling his people, you are inviting the Ottoman armies into your territory by colluding with this outlaw, Zenerbe, the Kurd in Berber. Stay away from him. Do not collude with him. Listen to me. I am your leader. I am your follower. And of course, the people tell him, God forbid, we don't want the Ottoman troops in here. Marshamun continues, are we not suffering enough at present from other quarters that you must need plunge yourselves into misery irredeemable? As it is, while you are at peace with Muhammad Pasha, in other words, the Pasha of Mosul, on good terms with the Kurds of Berwar, you can go and come, cut wood for your fires, gather thorns for your sheep, trade and travel without fear of molestation. But if it be true that you are abetting Zenerbe, as I said before, you cannot go better way to lose those advantages and to put a yoke upon your necks, such as you have not hitherto borne. So he is warning them, according to Badger, that if you continue to cooperate with this Kurdish rebel, you will bring the Ottomans into your territory and we will have a whole lot of trouble. He is more concerned with Ottoman armies at this point than he is with the Kurds around him, than he is with Badr Khan or with Nurallah or any other Kurdish chief. Here the patriarch pauses, and while the people present in Ashitha are conversing together, he asks for more. And he tells them, friends and brethren, if you wish to prove to the Pasha of Mosul and to me that you are faithful, I will advise you what to do. You must assemble a force of 300 strong from this village and march instantly against Zinarbe, rout his followers, and if possible, capture the chief alive or dead, Chaye and Mita. I understand that he has not many men with him and that your cause and courage are better than his. In thus doing, you will remove the most distant cause of complaint against you, and Muhammad Pasha will be convinced of your sincerity. So what Marshaman is calling for, and this is, you should not find it strange, because really Marshaman has become a leader of the Assyrians, and he is not simply a religious leader, he is also a mediator among them, but he is also telling them what to do in terms of earning a better position, earning a better status in the eyes of Muhammad Pasha of Mosul, who is going to control this area because, keep in mind, the centralizing efforts of the Ottomans. And his place will be better, and he will of course, get credit, as it were, from the Pasha and in turn from the Ottoman port, from the sublime port. And he will have rid himself of a plague to the south of the Hakkari Zenerbe. And he will be on better terms with the Pasha, as will the Assyrians. And the Ottoman armies do not have to come to these areas. As the patriarch is speaking to the people of Ashitha, two armed Kurds enter the village. They are sent to invite the patriarch to a meeting with Nurallah. So speaking of one of the devils he is concerned about, the Kurdish emissaries accompanied by an Assyrian priest from the village over give a letter to Marshaman. And Badger tells us that the priest came forward, knelt on one knee while he kissed the patriarch's hand and received his benediction. Always remember the patriarch holds this special place among the various tribes of Assyrians and whether people follow him, whether they disagree with him, whether they are loyal to him or not, all of the Assyrians have a certain type of reverence as if the patriarch is of royal lineage. Always when approaching the patriarch, the Assyrians kneel or kiss his hand. This is the custom. And the Kurds 
also make a low bow at the door, then approach most reverently. And after having placed a letter on the ground before Marshaman, before the patriarch, they stand with folded arms until directed to sit. So the Kurds also have a great deal of respect for Marshaman. They are directed to sit and then they wait. The patriarch rose to obtain the letter as a token of respect, just like the emissaries have respect for the patriarch, the patriarch shows respect for the emir of the Hakkari. He takes the letter and um, reads it, and it is appointing a place. Uh, it is um, a request from the emissaries that the patriarch appoint a place where Nurallah and the patriarch meet to hash things over, to cement their friendship together. Unfortunately for Nurallah, who is trying seemingly to make peace here, the patriarch's brother, Shamasha Ishaq, broke out into a furious invective, writes Badger. What, said he, send to make friends with us whom he has driven forth to wander about the mountains for the last nine years? Remember, Nurallah was the cause of the burning of the house of the patriarch. Mighty fine terms, says Shamasha Ishaq, terms he will doubtless propose. Is it not Nurallah Beg, the man who has oppressed us, that we were never, um, as we were never oppressed? Is it not he who has sullied our honor in the face of our people? And of course, when he says this, the villagers cry out, never, never. In other words, the honor of the patriarch can never be sullied or his family. Is it not Nur Allah Beg who burned our paternal dwelling and made us vagabonds in our own land? No, the land does not belong to us or to him, but to these, snatching down my Turkish fez, putting it upon his head and pointing to me as I sat a silent spectator of the scene. And now he would make peace, said Shamasha Ishaq. This last paragraph I need to explain because it's been referred to by many writers in the future as a very critical statement. What did the Shamasha intend in front of these Kurds, these emissaries of Nurallah, who was going to be Marshamun and the Assyrians' greatest enemy, by pointing? to the Turkish fez worn by a British missionary. Was it that he was referring to the Turks or the Ottomans? Or was he referring to the British when he pointed to Badger and said, these, the land belongs to these? It is thought that his intention, of course, um, which may have been skewed or changed or possibly even misunderstood by the Kurds as a reference to the British, meaning to Westerners. But it's likely that the intention of the Shamasha, the brother of the patriarch, was that this land is owned by the Ottomans. That coincides, that really comes together with the understanding of the patriarch himself, that the greater power around us and even among us, is really the Ottoman power. And the move towards centralization as part of the Ottoman Empire is something that we should recognize and something that is inevitable. And it is going to change everything. And this is the situation that we are in right now. So the patriarch's brother tells the Kurds that, hey, listen, we can't work things out between us. We don't own this land. You don't own this land. Really, this land is owned by the Ottomans. Now, in 1842, of course, the, the um, emissaries go back and they inform uh, Nurallah of what the patriarch's brother has said. And the patriarch is kind to the emissaries much more than his brother, who's... Um, kind of shouting and aggressive uh, behavior that Badger describes is um, um, the, the Kurds sit in mute silence, we are told, uh, and, and simply listen to him without saying a word. 
but the patriarch is very kind to the emissaries and he is told that um he's he tells them that um i unfortunately cannot come i have guests and so i have to do this and do that so unfortunately i can't make it he is not outright rejecting he is in other words leaving an opportunity but all the while of course it is very important for the patriarch and he makes this known to his people that our plight is really in the hands of the ottomans much more than the kurds now, Nurullah Beg is a rather scheming fellow, uh, if nothing else. And so he is seeking assistance from uh, the Persians or the Iranians across the border. When he hears that there might be a clash of forces between the Ottomans and the Iranians. And so he swears at one point in allegiance to the Shah and allies with his brother-in-law Badr Khan and convinces him also to ally with uh, the Iranians rather than the Ottomans. And so you could see, of course, there probably was intelligence on the part of the Ottomans that the Kurds might go this way, they might go that way. Even though the Assyrians seem to be loyal, Marshamun has pretensions of temporal or political power and so maybe that is not a desirable thing either. Let's see if we can have them come into conflict with each other. The Pasha of Mosul, both openly and secretly, sows conflict and hostility between the Assyrians and the Kurds, in particular those of Darwar and Botan, while he continues his agitation among the Hakkari Kurds. And we can add, while he continues to correspond with Marshamun in a series of letters. And we are, by the way, I should tell you, we are digging up a lot of these Ottoman documents and we will have them translated and we will share them, of course, uh, in, in writings with you. Um, Mara Oraham writes to Dr. Grant, behold, we anxiously await your coming again because he has left. We desire you to write us a letter telling us of your affairs and what we may expect from you because we are in great trouble and oppression and distress from our hostile enemies who are surrounding us to destroy us. We have no place of refuge to recline our heads upon from the bitter persecution which has befallen us from our enemies who are plotting our destruction. This is the missionary herald. Uh, Horatio uh, Southgate, delegate of the American Episcopal Church, uh, to Reverend uh, Tomlinson, secretary of um, another um, missionary enterprise, says intelligence has been received from Mosul that the independent Assyrians of Kurdistan have been surrounded by the Kurdish Bay of the vicinity acting in concert with the Ottoman government, meaning most likely with Muhammad Pasha of Mosul. The patriarch Marshamun of Julamark or of Qutanis has been seized. Of course, this is not accurate. As the report goes, his house is burnt. That part of the report is accurate. This act has been in contemplation some two or three years at least, meaning the Ottoman Empire, along with the Kurds, have been planning this. You know that the patriarch has hitherto been the civil as well as the spiritual chief of his people, and that they have paid no taxes and have been, in every sense of the word, independent. The information is not definite, but it is well known to be impossible for an army to penetrate into the fastness of the northern mountains. I presume that the people have not themselves been conquered, but that the patriarch, as their chief, has been compelled to acknowledge allegiance to the sultan and to stipulate for a certain amount of tax from his nation. Doubtless also, the Kurdish chief has been appointed ruler of the whole mountain district and the Assyrians are subject to their greatest enemies, the Kurds. Now we are told um, in a report from the foreign office, the result of all this we cannot foresee, the patriarch may retreat to the strongholds of his people and set at defiance all power from without, 
this would probably bring on a mountain warfare in which the Kurds who have never been able to stand against the Assyrians are likely to be worsted. Or if, or he may find it necessary to continue his new allegiance and yield to apprehension hitherto unheard of among his people. In this case, a new era will open up upon the Nestorians. Their country hitherto accessible only to their friends will be equally accessible to their enemies. Once annexed to the Ottoman dominions, the firmans of the Sultan will prevail there, and any Frank traveler who pleases may go over to the country or reside there. There are some who think that this will be a happy consummation, but I fear otherwise. So important to know that the British were not entirely against the Ottoman Empire. As we said before, it may have been their interest in practicing real politique, and this is the way international relations works, that they may have been more concerned with Russian power penetrating into the Ottoman Empire than they were with collapsing or allowing the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. In other words, the sick man of Europe, being the Ottoman Empire, was better for them than a strong power of Russia penetrating these areas and to the exclusion, possibly to the exclusion of the British. So the British did not necessarily see that their policy um, forbade the Ottomans from asserting their power over the Assyrians, possibly even with the assistance of the Kurds. 1842 to 1843, the Kurdish tribes gather and prepare for war between Ottomans and Iran and to possibly switch sides. Yahya Khan, Nurallah, Suleiman Bey, Align, these are the Kurdish chiefs, and Nurallah was the uncle of Suleiman Bey. Nurallah promises American missionary safety and promises to allow them to build their schools. The Kurds meet Marshamun and Ashitha during this time, attempt to forge an alliance and fail. Marshamun refuses to align with the Kurds against the Ottomans. Now, one of the things that the Kurds were trying to do is that Nurallah, specifically the chief of Hakkari, was colluding with Ismail Pasha, who was trying to, again, seek his um, um, palace or, or um, jurisdiction in Amedia, the city of Amedia, from the Ottomans, uh, but both of them fail. Some Assyrians had joined with the Kurds, but remember earlier that Marshamun was invited to join, and he had prepared an army of 3,000 to assist Ismail Pasha. Ismail Pasha never forgot that Marshamun withdrew because he had received word from Muhammad Pasha, and he refused to help Ismail Pasha, and so Ahmadiyya was lost. Without the Assyrians, without the Assyrian warriors at his side, Ismail Pasha had no hope of conquering Ahmadiyya again. Nurallah and Badr Khan know that Marshamun is in touch with Muhammad Pasha of Mosul, and this is, of course, fatal to Marshamun. The spring and summer of 1843, Nurallah and Badr Khan look south towards Zinar Bey, who was an enemy of the Assyrians. Remember the speech that Marshamun gave in Ashitha regarding this outlaw uh, to Muhammad Pasha, and they send messages uh, to the Pasha uh, regarding Grant's fortress. Remember that at first they tell him it's okay to build. You as an American uh, are going to be okay. We have no problem with you. But to the Pasha of Erzurum, to the, to the Ottoman Pasha, they say, well, he's building a fortress over here. So, so they speak with uh, the double message here to... Uh, grant, they say, we are going to assist you. you, we have no problem with you, and indeed, they do not. But to the Ottoman officials, they say, we are privy to this information that this Westerner is building a fortress, and it might be a problem for all of us, because it's going to really encourage, as it were, or, or strengthen Western influence in our midst. Muhammad Pasha 
assures Badr Khan that he would not interfere with his war against the Assyrians. Nurallah and Badr Khan insist that Marshamun give up all his political and temporal power, political power, um, uh, and Assyrians accept Nurallah as their emir. Now remember that he had imposed the Islamic tax on the Assyrians, and many Assyrians refused to surrender to um, uh, Nurallah. Sulaiman Bey sends message to Diari and to other Assyrians to surrender, otherwise they will be conquered. Diz is attacked, and then Chumba of Diari is attacked. So various Assyrian tribes are attacked, and the resulting slaughter of the various Assyrians in, in multiple villages across Diari are in particular, and Diz uh, as well as Kuchanis are attacked, and the Assyrians lose over 10,000 of their own. Mostly it is the people of Diari that bear the greatest brunt. But the people of Diari and the Assyrians did not simply surrender to Badr Khan. They also fought to the last, and one of them, uh, now the picture is of uh, Malik Ismail of later years, but this is the story of Malik Ismail in the 1800s. And we are told by Laird, who spoke to an eyewitness of this event, that when Chumba was taken over, Chumbat Malik, it is called in Diari, that wounded with his hip bone cracked by a musket ball, the Malik was carried into a cave until he was betrayed by a woman who was threatened with death. They were looking for the Malik. And once he was found out, he was dragged by Kurds and placed before Badr Khan, who asked him, who was this infidel who dared to shed the blood of believers, of Muslim believers? And we are told by this eyewitness that the Malik rose a bit, having been wounded. He said, this arm has taken the lives of nearly 20 Kurds, and had God spared me, as many more would have fallen by it. And so the Malik was taken and beheaded over the Zab River. This shows you really these, these reports, the spirit of, although the Assyrians became victims from time to time, that also shows you the spirit of um, defiance that the Assyrians had, of the courage they had, and the ability to fight that made them dreaded by their enemies.